Welcome to my solo ep. Do you love it? I love it. I get to tell you about the things about myself that um, hopefully you like to know and hear. I'm recording on Warundry land still, but I'm at home today because I have the shits. Literally. Um, don't have a bug, so I was a bit worried. I was like, oh, no, have I got a bit of gastro? You know, it's going around. It's going around. Don't you love that saying? It's going around. <laughs> I think we all know where that's come, and come from it's because it's just things go around. Um, but, no, this one, I had dreadful uh, cramps last night. Perimenopause, everything's perimenopause. So the cramps were waking me up. And I had to spray the, the magnesium and I had to, I, I actually took a, another magnesium tablet, which means um, my tummy turns to mush, my bowels, I should say, everything that's really, it's like a um, pro heart painting, honestly. It is just throwing shit at a fucking canvas, that poor toilet. Um, but let's move on. Had a lovely weekend and I'm going to jones about something that I was reminded of this weekend. I went to a farewell, which I'm very upset about. My beautiful beloveds, Spunner and Adzi, um, who live around the corner, have decided to move to Darwin. Don't you hate it when that happens? It's wonderful and it was so funny because I've just been to Darwin so I was doing the, where, what what suburb are you moving to? Because I know Darwin now and they're telling me and I'm acting like I know where the hell they're, t- what they're talking about but I kind of did because Darwin's tiny and the, the tour bus that we did, they did the first day, they took us around Darwin. It took all of two minutes but they showed us the, like without pointing out everything and, and it was really fascinating Darwin because you know it was bombed and it has you know so many things so much history about it so they're moving to a beautiful four-bedroom house with a pool because that's what you get in Darwin they're going from a two-bedroom unit in Melbourne to a four-bedroom resort by the look of things they showed us you know the you know how everyone you know you get the phone out and you go oh have a look at the place we got already I'm like, oh, my God. They're stoked because they can have, you know, so many people visit. When when you go, it's funny, like in Melbourne I have I have a spare room. In Sydney I've never had a spare room. No one I know in Sydney except for one couple has a spare room and they're the only people I can stay <laughs> Because in Sydney it is just ridiculously priced. If you're renting... You are not renting a spare, you know, you are not renting with a spare room. You need to have a lot of money to have that spare room. So anyway, while we were out, we were talking about Osher Ginsburg's post where he likened um, the conspiracy of the no, not understanding um, vote, which I'm not going to get into. He likened it to the myth and if you hear enough times someone saying something, you will believe it. And he likened it to this particular story which went around. Everyone has this story. Everyone knows this story. It doesn't matter where you are from. I grew up in, in Seaforth, so we had it at the Manly Water Slides. Remember the old story where they said, don't go down the water slide because someone's put razor blades on bubble gum and everyone's getting cut up. <laughs> Well, he told that story because he grew up on the Gold Coast and it was Grundy's. Grundy's was the one up there. I don't know anyone who, in, especially in this country, especially from my age group, Rach, give me a nod if you knew, like you're, what, 20, 28? So did you have that myth? Okay, she did as well. She's nodding. So she's 28, I'm 50. We've all had this. Uh, it's from it's since the 70s this has been around. Anyway, so we were chatting about it. And this guy on the weekend goes, oh, no, I'm from Tasmania. I, my friend had the scarring up his back. And I'm like, what? What? So I was like, upon further, you know, um, further thinking... I said to him, hang on. He goes, yeah, he was a real naughty kid. Uh, We used to steal things together. 
you know, when we were teenagers. And I was like, do you think maybe he was just flogged and he didn't want to say that that's what had been happening? Not flogged, like, but, you know, some parent had, I'd say, taken the iron, iron cord or, you know... And he said, you know what, he probably did and he didn't want to say that and so he's heard the myth and gone, yeah, look, look. And I, of course, have gone in my brain in the last two nights thinking about the the mechanics of it. I'm like, if someone did put razor blades <laughs> in the tubes of water slides and there's gushing water, how? How did they stay there? If they were put on the side... How, what, would, wouldn't it just be one slice? How would you have it on, or, like, and is it, it'd be more than one person, right? And what about if they do it without the water in there? They'd have to crawl in. That's really hot. Like, it's hot plastic. And the whole texture changes once the water hits it because if you're going through it dry, you can't move. You have to get that, you, you know, you know what it's like. Um, and then you'd make sure you got the mats as well because you're like, oh, if they're in there, you're going to just slice up the mats, <laughs> Anyway, when I was a teen, this brought back a memory for me um, of people believing things. When I was, I think, in year eight or year nine, my mother came into my bedroom, knocked on my door and slid my door open because I had a sliding door. I was probably writing out the lyrics to a Wham song, stopping the tape and starting it again, rewinding it. And I was like, what, what, what do you want? Um, hoping she was going to give me a snack. And she said, did you beat a girl's head against a brick wall? And I went, what? <laughs> and she goes, did you beat a girl's head against a brick wall? And I went, whose head? And she goes, just answer the question. And I went, no. <laughs> and she goes, thank you. And just walked away. And then I followed her out, of course. She was so angry. And I was like, what's going on? And she said, your grandmother has just called me. My grandmother lived an hour and a half away in Sydney. And she's called my mother to say that my auntie Ray, who's my mum's sister-in-law, these are the two wives of brothers, my dad and his brother, right? My mother's never liked Auntie Ray. She never liked because she used to fat shame her all the time. Um, Auntie Ray lived up on the Gold Coast. Her sister, Pat Pugsley. <laughs> her sister, Pat Pugsley. Well, her kid, they lived close by to us and her kids went to high school, my high school. And Pat Pugsley was in the canteen. She used to do the canteen. My mother was never canteen. Like she did it maybe a couple of times in primary school and then she was like, this gossip is not for me. Like, these women are not for me. Um, so <laughs> my grandmother has had a phone call from Arnie Ray on the Gold Coast who'd had a phone call from Pat Pugsley, her sister, on the Central Coast to say Yvette's bashed a girl's head against a brick wall. <laughs> and I'm laughing now, but it's not funny. My mother was absolutely... She was so angry because she knew it wasn't true. She knew I've not done that. And I knew I'd not done that. But the whole women had been through the canteen. Like, they were such a gossip. And, and the thing is that across the road, okay, here's another name for you, Vicky Weston, across the road, her mum hated me because... <laughs> She used to not want Vicky to hang out with me because she didn't know, but Vicky was the really bad um, influence. But it, she didn't want to admit that her daughter was the bad influence. So I was the bad influence. I used to get influence. I'd do anything anyone told me to do. And um, she – or maybe I was a bad influence. I did start smoking when I was about 11. <laughs> So I probably influenced Vicky Weston, who's gone home to her mum and said, Yvette's trying to make me smoke the butts of her mum's menthol ciggies. <laughs> it's just what I did. Only because I loved my mum so much I wanted to be her. You remember, like I've talked about this before, I was so in love with my mum that I wanted to smoke like her. I wanted to do the hand movements, the blowing, the breathing in, everything exactly the same as Susan Beryl. Unbeknownst to me, she was going to die of this habit. But um, isn't that funny how you are so, 
you know, you want to be someone. Anyway, so I probably did badly influence Vicky Weston, but Vicky Weston's mum was the one who really didn't like me. And I knew she didn't like me because she made sure I got kicked out of Girl Guides and I hadn't done anything wrong in Girl Guides. And mum thought that was a bit sus. So anyway, mum knew I'd stolen her butts from a ciggies and she was just like, you can't do that. And I was like, yeah, but you smoke. And she goes, I know, but I'm an adult and I'm silly. I really don't want you smoking. So anyway, she knew. I my, I had the kind of mum that I could just tell her everything and anything, you know. And I did. I told her way too many things. But that punching or smashing a girl's head against a brick wall, we kind of let it go at the time because mum was so angry about it and she knew I hadn't done it. But on the weekend I'm thinking about it. So I'm trying to think of the the machinations of that, Right. And I'm saying to these people that I was out with on the weekend after the, the water slide, you know, how? How do they get the, the the chewing gum? What kind of chewing gum do you need to make it stick? I'm going, why wasn't there – why wasn't there – I didn't even know the girl that I apparently was supposed to have hit. And why wasn't there blood? Why wasn't I dobbed in? Where were the police? Where were the teachers? Like this is how – how – much someone, you can believe something that has no evidence whatsoever, so much so that there was a group of women in a canteen on a daily basis talking about a 14-year-old teenage girl being an abuser, (laughs) a violent offender, and no one questioned it. Like My mum didn't even go up against them because she knew she just it was just such, you know, oh, don't pay it any mind. But I remember on the weekend thinking, I had people at school scared of me and I never knew why. Because I never bullied anyone. Like I was kind of the fat, funny girl. So that's why, must have been why. They <laughs> I had a reputation that preceded me that hadn't, hadn't any basis. <laughs> Anyway, that was my that was my jonesing for this week. It's a, a funny thing how a child, I was still a child, and I had a group of grown-up adults, grown-up women with nothing better to do than slander my name simply because one of them didn't like me. So never believe anything. I am one of those people that believe things when people tell me. I'm like, oh, Really? Now I'm like, oh, you're full of shit. Still trouble with Mari. Rings me up while I'm at work. Major drama. I've had a collapse, she says. Can you come over straight away, she says. So what'd you say? I said, darling. I said, pet. I said, darling. I said, please, pet. When you have calmed down, please listen to my side of the story. <laughs> I love your emails. Thank you all so much for sending them through. Two girls at novapodcast.com.au if you want to send your own. This week's one, just opening it now, hang on. This week's one comes from Natalie. Hi, Natalie. (laughs) She says, I was just listening to your episode last week and wanted to pick your brain some more about surrendering a dog. Great topic, great topic, because last week, please, if you haven't listened, go back and listen, but quickly, it was me saying, we've got to stop judging people for surrendering their dogs. You don't know the situation. So she, so I, and I also said, because, you know, a dog can be in a worse situation and we're judging them and saying, oh, dogs are for life. Don't get rid of your dog, you know, um, and when the dog is not having a good life. So she said this, I haven't ever heard someone speak so openly and compassionately about surrendering a dog. Listening to you speak, I was wondering, is there a hotline people can call to discuss surrendering their dog? What is the surrendering process? I'm happy to share my personal experience where I am at. Before we go into that, there isn't a hotline. 
Um, but I'd suggest right then and there to chat with rescue people, foster people, chat to me. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone about surrendering a dog or not surrendering a dog or, you know, whether you want to do it or not, or if, if there are options. I find a lot of people simply don't have help. Um, and sometimes there are people who want to help and you don't know they exist. She says, um, we have a beautiful 14-year-old Staffy who we rescued as a puppy. For the first 10 years of her life, we did everything with her. But four years ago, we had our first child. And life, as life changed, she struggled to fit in. But we persisted. However, over the past two years, her health has begun to deteriorate. And we struggle to give her the love and attention she deserves. I feel deeply that she deserves to be in a home that can give her the love and attention she needs. That, mean, that doesn't mean we don't love her. Do we ride this out knowing she may only have a few more years in her or would surrendering her be fairer on her? I'd love your advice. It's a great question. You know, and immediately I was set to judge. My immediate response was get rid of the child. (laughs) I'm sorry. I apologise. I hope that made someone laugh. I know it made my producer laugh. She's evil though. Um, No, you obviously can't get rid of the child. But I think um, 14, you've got an ageing dog there and deteriorating. You said it yourself. Um, Without knowing too much of the details of her health, I think a dog of that age doesn't want to do much. You know, you said the first 10 years she did everything with you. So uh, she's at an age where she wants to sleep. So if that's the guilt you're feeling, that you're leaving her at home to take the kid out to things that dogs can't simply go to, which is a lot of things, um, you know, you may not realise how little she wants to go out. A little walk at, at the age of 14 for a staffy is kind of all they need, maybe once a day, twice a day. Max, um, I looked after a friend, Staffy, when she was pregnant because she couldn't stand the smell of the dog anymore. She was getting old and she stunk. Um, I really judged her internally, but I was like, I'm helping because I was, you know, so all about the dog. But I also now realise that that, you know, she couldn't help that. And she was putting the dog outside because she was, it was making her physically ill. If you, like, I'm, I'm wondering what the health of this dog, like, is there a bad smell? Is there, um, you know, can she walk, not walk properly? Is she on medication? Is it like a financial thing? You know, if you really do think it's just that you're not giving her the attention and the love that she deserves, at 14, they don't need a lot. Um, Let me know where you are, though, because if someone else is listening that can give a home to a senior and is living close by, this this could work. Um, You could surrender her to someone that... I mean, I ended up with that staffy and she slept on a beanbag in front of our heater and she was just so happy. So that could that could happen. Um, but saying that, you know, um, I don't think she has very long to live. So I don't know that Staffies really live that far further than 15, 16. So you may only have at max two years left with her. Um, but you ask around for your family and friends as well and don't feel so guilty Um, You've given her a brilliant life and you're still giving her a great life. And, you know, dogs are pack animals. They just want to be there. They just want to be in your existence. They don't like being alone, but older dogs don't mind being alone, especially having the reprieve of a child around them, the sound of the screaming and the squealing and the, you know, all of that kind of thing. They're probably happy to just sleep. Um, Maybe I need more information, but, yeah, Definitely surrender if you know in your heart. Um, And if someone is interested, well, let's find out where you are first and see if there's anyone who is interested. But I hope that helps a little bit. Um, 
I still, you know, if you want to get rid of the kid, I still, you know, agree with that. <laughs> No. <gasps> Beautiful stuffies. You know, they're my favourite profile on Instagram, Wolfgang2242. If you're not following it, follow it right now. Open up your Instagram, go to that little circle at the bottom, press that and type in Wolfgang2242. This is a guy called Steve Gregg and he only adopts senior dogs. But he also has a pig, he has a turkey, he has chickens, but he's got about 11 seniors at the moment and he writes so beautifully. He always takes the dogs that no one wants. He says, the one that's been here the longest is the one I want. He also does all this amazing work with um, rescue foundations and he's developed with another company, developed a, a, t- a type of, I guess, vitamin or supplement or something for ageing dogs. Like he's, But he's just a great source to follow and see how giving the dignity and the love um, and the, the life that old dogs deserve, it actually really inspires you. So if Natalie's, you know, listening to this now, go and let Steve, go and let my favourite, um, Fernando, who it wears a nappy, he's the tiniest little Yorkie and he smiles in every photo like he knows that he's a model. And Onion, his latest one is called Onion because his head is so big that he looks like an onion. Go and follow Steve. Go and follow Wolfgang and um, let him inspire you. Thank you. Okay, what have we got today? Okay, I've actually had someone text me that they – not text, sorry, this is a DM from uh, one of my followers called Jess – Hi, Jess. Um, I wanted, I won't say what she wrote first because it gives the saying away, but she said that she, someone has just said it to her and I thought of you as that would be a good Evie-ism for the podcast. Hello. I think we just got a new term. Thank you, Jess. All right. In the past, so I've looked it up and this is what I've come up with. In the past, without the use of modern com. I'm going to start that again, but we're going to keep that in. Okay, because everyone needs to know that I make mistakes and we all make mistakes and I'm not as perfect as you thought I was. Okay, in the past, without the use of modern communication devices, a ship's appearance upon the immediate return to the port could communicate how the crew fared at sea. Hmm, I see you pondering, Rachel. I can smell your brain from here. Ships that were victorious in their endeavours, example, an encounter with an enemy ship, would sail into port with flags flying from the mastheads. A ship that had been defeated, though, on the other hand, would be forced to strike her colours to lower the flags, signifying defeat. Also, the word colours is a common way to describe flags and insignia of military units still to this day. So the ships would come into port and they would pass all of the people and they would have their flags flying as they passed. What do you think, Rachie Poo? You're, you're laughing because you don't know. Are you embarrassed? You should be. No. <laughs> the, the saying is to pass with flying colours. Ah, oh, you've just done what everyone at home or in their car or while they're walking has just done. Isn't that a good one? She said she just heard someone say they passed with flying colours. So today it still means to be victorious, but we we do it more like if you have a test or, you know, but it's a great, it, that's where it comes from. And I think that's a great one. And, you know, wave, wave your freak flag, I say. <laughs> I don't know where that one comes from. Let's not go there. That's, that's it for this week. What did you think about that, peoples? Thanks for listening. 
we will have part two this Thursday of Melinda Willis. Hope you uh, have enjoyed it. We got the Logies gossip. Uh, let me know what you think, what you thought of last episode. If you haven't listened to it, what are you doing with your life? Get it in your ear. I love you all and I'll speak to you. I will literally speak to you soon. Ciao, ciao. What am I, Italian? <laughs>